All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Brown University Cancer Center Invited Research Seminar Series. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's great to have Dr. Ross Levine from Memorial Sloan Kettering here with us today. Uh, Ross is the Lawrence Joseph Dean Chair in Leukemia Research, Chief of the Molecular Cancer Medicine Service, and the Director of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Center for Hematologic Malignancies. Uh, he's also a member of the Human Oncology and Pathogenesis Program at Sloan Kettering and the Leukemia Service in the Department of Medicine, and also a professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, Dr. Levine earned his MD degree from Johns Hopkins and completed residency in internal medicine at the MGH and fellowship in Hemonc at Dana-Farber before joining the faculty at Sloan Kettering. Uh, he's a physician scientist who's focused on uh, uh, blood and bone marrow cancers, including AML, polycythemia vera, and myelofibrosis, uh, discovery and role of somatic mutations in these heme malignancies using candidate gene, uh, genome-wide and functional approaches. And he has a specific interest in signal transduction and transformation and mutations in epigenetic modifiers. Dr. Levine was one of the first uh, investigators to define the role of TET2, IDH1, uh, IDH2 mutations in hematologic malignancies, which led to molecularly targeted therapies for AML. He also played a key role in deciphering uh, the role of JAK-STAT activation in the myeloproliferative neoplasms, which led to approved therapies for those disorders. Uh, he's won a number of awards, including early in his career, uh, awards from ASCO and ASH, uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Scholar Award, and more recently in 2018, the William Damescheck uh, Prize from ASH. Uh, he was fortunate to have the unique experience of actually having Joe Biden tour his lab in May of 2016 when he visited Memorial Sloan Kettering. How cool is that? Um, uh, so it's great to have him here. One housekeeping item, uh, please enter your comments or questions in the chat and we will moderate at the end. So it's great to have Dr. Ross Levine here today speaking about deciphering and targeting clonal evolution in myeloid malignancy. Well, thanks, Wafik. It's great uh, to be here virtually with all of you today. And uh, it's really a pleasure and a privilege. And uh, I think it's great uh, that you have committed thanks uh, to Wafik and the rest of your efforts into sort of uh, staying connected. Because I think one of the biggest challenges in this uh, environment we're in is keeping our scientific connections alive. And I hope that some of the work I'll show you today might lead to dialogues with many of you, not just now, but uh, moving forward. And that I think is really important to us and I think to all of you. So no talk from Sloan Kettering is uh, complete without a disclosure slide. I'll just make two points. The first is I am on the board of directors of Kyogen, which is involved in every molecular biology experiment my lab does. And I have more recently in the last month joined the Scientific Advisory Board of a company called Mission Bio. And I will be talking about a technology I've been using up there for a couple of years. I joined their SAB because I was um, increasingly interacting with them. And no, I don't have any involvement in uh, the will we build the wall uh, campaign uh, that Steve Bannon appears to have gotten himself uh, involved with uh, today. One thing just before we talk about science is we live in really challenging times. And you know, for young investigators, I think it's important for folks that, to know that we hear you. We know how hard it is and we're here to support you. I'm putting a lot of effort, particularly with my ash um, hat and through my chairing of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Mark Foundation with trying to figure out ways to support young investigators. And I'd love to get people's ideas on that. To our colleagues that are spending time on the clinical services, I just say thank you. Um, and it's really, um, we all know how challenging it's been. I was on in April and it was a dicey time to be doing clinical work and everyone should just try to stay safe. And the last thing about that is that, you know, it's really hard, especially for young faculty 
uh, and trainees to realize that it's hard to be productive. And we're all struggling with it, um, whether it's just the stress of a pandemic or kids or distractions or, um, pardon my French, you know, who planned for this anyway? Um, and it's important to stay connected. And I think staying connected is more important than that grant or that paper. And really focusing on um, discrete goals is how we're approaching this. And I'm encouraging everybody to find ways to contribute. You know, review that grant or that paper, that grant. Have a conversation with a new collaborator. Do a meeting with a new mentee or mentor. You know, find a way to connect. And I know that that all is trite, but I really believe it's it's the only way we're going to get through this. And the goal is not to get through it back, back to where we you know with all of this horrible experience will get better in some ways. And I'll also make the point uh, that the work I do is done by these amazing people in the lab. Almost all the work today is done by Bobby and Lindy, two amazing postdocs in my lab who will be going on the job market next year. Um, and uh, Mike Wartz, a grad student, has done some of the uh, endothelial cell culturing I'll talk about. And Aaron Vinny, who's now no longer on the job market, but has accepted a job at Columbia, where he'll start in a month. And we've got great folks in the lab and great collaborators. So as you heard from Wafik's introduction, you know we've been very interested in myeloid malignancies for the past um, 12 years and uh, 11 months uh, as a lab. And the major focus for the past, I would say seven or eight years has been acute myeloid leukemia. And that really is because of the survival curves you see on this slide. That despite improvements in supportive care, modest improvements in the therapeutic armamentarium, you know, the survival until I would argue the last four or five years really didn't make a significant dent, even if you can get a p-value that a statistician will um, sign off on. And the question is, why has AML been such a hard disease to um, therapeutically attack? And I think one answer is from this data. This is gene expression data from Peter Valk and Ruth Dellwell, where they did in the mid-90s the typical gene expression uh, classifier study in AML. And the thing I want to leave you with is the idea that there are 16 distinct clusters. So unlike breast cancer or brain tumors, where there are four to five distinct groups, depending on whether you're a lump or a splitter, AML is 16 diseases and it's rare. So the idea that you'd find a drug that works in a model and then you treat 20 people on a phase one trial, you may actually have you know, only one patient who has the right um, molecular subtype and that's a real challenge. And until the past you know, couple of years, we had only had two classes of agents approved for AML, hypomethylating agents and gemtuzumab. The other thing that's important is that AML is a disease as most adult tumors are of the aging population median age of 68, patients who are older do worse. And there's a lot of interpatient and uh, biologic clinical heterogeneity, and that's um, shown here, that AML is complicated. On the other hand, if you look at AML from a sort of somatic genetic perspective, it's actually simple. It's the most simple adult tumor. There are only 50 to 70 recurrently mutated genes in AML with a frequency of greater than 0.5%. There are three to eight coding mutations per AML genome. I'm not saying that there aren't non-coding and microRNAs and RNA binding effects, but the somatic genome in adult tumors, it doesn't get more tractable than this. And the way I think of this, and is really exemplified in this last bullet, and this is really our thesis in the lab, is that a small number of mutations in different permutations give rise to different outcomes in every patient, both prognosis and biology. So the question ultimately is how do you take a small number of options and mix and match them and in every patient get a different subtype? And that's sort of what we spend our time uh, sort of perseverating and investigating and trying to uh, understand. The other layer I wanna leave you with is the recent discovery in the past 10 years of a phenomenon we call clonal hematopoiesis. About eight years ago, a colleague of mine, Lambert Busk and I, showed that in about one in 20 elderly individuals who don't have leukemia, we can find recurrent mutations in the known leukemia driver tattoo. And then data from uh, Ravi Majetti and John Dick showed that even in leukemia patients, you can see these antecedent clones, especially at times of remission. And then Ben Ebert and Sid Jaiswal and um, Steve McCarroll showed that as many as 20% of the aging population have initiating leukemia mutations that are easily detectable in one to 2% of their peripheral blood or more. And this has huge implications, including the fact that if you had a solid tumor patient and you sequence their blood as a control as we do with Sloan, 
you know, one in five of them is going to have a leukemia mutation in their blood. And so we've created a program around that. The second is that following MRD and AML or doing a non-invasive genomic monitoring, you got to not only monitor a mutation, but the mutations that are in the leukemia versus the pre-leukemic clone. And then Ben Ebert is shown um, that clonal metapoiesis is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And we believe in the long term, the goal will be to ultimately understand the high-risk patients who don't yet have leukemia. And if we can find therapeutic targets with a wide enough therapeutic index, we're going to want to intercept and prevent leukemia from ever developing. And that really is sort of the organizing concept that my lab is interested in. But the fundamental question that I think I'll try to address today, at least the first half of my talk, is what I call the mathematical quandary. And that is the following. But there are 20 million people in the United States, that's a back of the nap, you know, envelope calculation, have mutations in DNM, T, TAT, ASXL1, and genes like that. But there are only 30,000 AML, MDS, and MPN patients diagnosed a year. And what that means is that these early events are not rate limiting. They have to be occurring at a pretty high rate. And it's not dissimilar. I'm looking at Wafiq because he was in the Vogelstein lab. And you know, we knew for years that these polyps have these initiating mutations. And but we didn't even know what the equivalent was in blood until the past 10 years. And we now know that it's like having a polyp. And so the question is not how do you get the initiating polyp, but what is special or unfortunate about the 30,000 per year that go on to disease? And so my lab has sort of organized itself with trying to understand these features. What are the events that initiate the process and increase the fitness of stem cells that lead to um, early clonal expansion? Why are only a subset of patients developing disease? Is it because the order or mutational type or cell type, like what is different, the microenvironment? And then last but not least, when you have an over disease, um, is what do you target? Do you target the mutations that cause the leukemia or do these pre um, leukemic or clonal hematopoiesis mutations remain therapeutically tracking. And so how do we think about this? And so I have two analogies I like to use. One is a Jenga puzzle. And so the way we think of it with a Jenga puzzle would be that what we want to do in the lab is use genomic technologies to understand all the building blocks that give you an AML. And then once we know that, I want to figure out which ones we can pull out to make it crash down. The other analogy, and I, don't, I usually choose one or the other, is the Star Wars analogy that AML is like the Death Star. We need to understand the blueprint, and then we need to find that one shoot that we're going to shoot that um, torpedo down and make it come down. And so what I'll try to do today in the first half of my talk is understand how do we understand how AML is built, and then I'm going to argue at the end that we're going to try to understand how we take it apart. And so how do we know how AML is built? So we know uh, from work from many groups with bulk sequencing that based on very little frequency in AML, we can sort of make some general predictions about what are the early events in AML, like the clonal metapoiesis mutations. One of the later events that occur in, for example, signaling effectors is what Beek mentioned, another interest of mine for many years. And so this is really good on a population basis, but the problem with this is that you can't, you know, with absolute granularity, reconstruct the genealogy of the leukemia from a normal stem cell in every patient based on bulk sequencing. You can do a pretty good job and you can get general patterns, but you can't do this for patients. And so we've gotten very interested in conceptually, can we now develop analytic and genomic approaches to actually accurately decipher clonal trajectories from normal to pre-malignant to malignant cells? So can we better delineate the sequential acquisition of mutations? Can we understand what are the key events that promote clonal expansion and myelin transformation? Are there different trajectories that give you AML in different subtypes? And also, is AML a single linear trajectory to disease or is it a milieu or population of clones? And can we ultimately link all of these insights to therapeutic dependencies? And so we think the answer here is single cell profiling, but it's not single cell RNA profiling, which is what you read about every week, obviously, in uh, Nature. And so about two years ago, Lindy and Bobby um, set out to, instead of doing single cell RNA profiling, to do single cell DNA profiling. And again, we use this platform from Mission Bio, full conflict of interest, I'm on their SAB now, basically allows us to take anywhere from one to 10,000 cells from patients and to delineate in every one of those cells with a panel, the mutational call for each of these genes at every amplicon we design. 
And so we've done about 150 patients. And then I'll show you data where we combine that with flow. All of the um, data, or most of the data I will present today is in a preprint um, on BioArchive, and there's similar data of Koichi Akahachi. And there actually is a manuscript uh, that will be out at some point uh, this fall. Um, that will have the final uh, version, which I can uh, tell you about. And you'll see the parts of it that are in the preprint. And so what do we do? We sequence thousands of cells from every patient. And what we're able to do in every patient is delineate the, what we call the clonotypes. And so you can see each of these different bar graphs is a different clone. This one has an IDH, stag 2 and NRAS. This one has IDH, stag 2 and a different NRAS. And you can see heterozygous and homozygous clones. And one of the things I want to leave you with is that in many cases, and if you actually tried to deconvolute even this patient, you would already know based on the presence of a STAG2 mutant only and an IDH2 mutant only and a double mutant, that one of those mutations actually has to occur more than once. And we think there's a lot of great examples in AML of recurrent acquisition of the same mutations over and over again. And so we're able to develop these chronotypes. And so what did we learn? So we took a set of patients, we took clonal hematopoiesis, all of the CH patients we studied had more than one mutation, because why would you do single cell DNA if there's only one mutation? We took NPN, we took patients with epigenetic regulatory mutations, oops, or with um, epigenetic plus signaling mutations. And so what you can see is that the mutational frequency increases as you go um, from a pre-malignant to an overt disease, as does the number of clones, but the number of clones increases more than the number of mutations. So not only is there additional additive mutations, but there clearly is branching out in distinct clones. If you look at clonal hematopoiesis, what we observed, and remember every CH patient we studied in our cohort with single cell profiling had more than one mutation. And what we observe in every patient is um, oligoclonal disease. So what you don't see in CH is evidence of stacking mutations on top of each other. And so one thing we think may distinguish pre-malignant from malignant disease is not that you can't have multiple mutations in a pre-malignant state, but those are occurring in different clones. Whereas once a clone starts to pick up steam and acquire the mutations, it's progressing to um, a malignant state. And in fact, this shows that in AML, what we observe in AML is acquisition. In fact, what happens in about 86% of our AML patients is they either have one big clone or two big clones. And so what's fascinating about that is that means that you get all these different clones that are accumulating, but this one, this triad of heterozygous, oops, um, DNMT, um, IDH, and NPM1, that clone wins out. And because you not only can get what every cell has, but the number of cells with each clonotype, we know that that is the dominant clone. And so this suggests there's two possibilities. One is that that clone is just fitter than everyone else because it grows more or self-renews more. But the other possibility is maybe that clone secretes factors that disadvantages um, its antecedent clones. And our data can't distinguish um, between uh, those possibilities. We then wanted to go from just counting clones and uh, mutations to actually establishing clonal diversity. And so we're not complex mathematicians, but we have some computational chops in the lab. And so Bobby and Lindy set out to use a Shannon diversity index as a measure of clonal diversity. And what we can show is as disease progresses to most advanced or adverse prognosis AML, you actually can show that the Shannon diversity goes up, yet the size of the dominant clone gets smaller. So what we think is happening is although there still are dominant winter clones, there's a lot more subclonal diversity. And so this really suggests to us that it's not so simple that you get mutation, mutation, winter clone and it's over. There is ongoing clonal accumulation and evolution and it changes with different molecular subtypes. And so then we ask the really simple question, given now that we know that there are dominant clones and non-dominant clones, we ask are different mutations more or less likely to be in the dominant clone? What we're able to show is that some mutations like IDH2 or NPN1 are virtually always in the dominant clone. Whereas other mutations like KRAS and FLIP3 are almost always in the minor clone. And this really suggests that some mutations, clearly when they occur, they are clearly part of the process that enhances clonal dominance. And other mutations are perfectly happy to be in subclones that are in the milieu, but are not winning over all the others. And then you get a gene like TET2, which is like the joker. It's either in the dominant clone or it's in a subclone and every patient is different. It's very pleiotropic in its functionality. 
The challenge though with this data is that it's only looking at every mutation as a factor. What we really care about is combinations of mutations of clones. So on the left, this is what, if you look at bulk sequencing, at co-mutational patterns. And on the right, this is looking at single cell data at both exclusive or inclusive mutational patterns. So there's no doubt that instead of looking at mutations in 150 samples, and instead of looking at it in, you know, any, you know, probably roughly, you know, 500,000 cells from these 146 patients, we get a lot more data. So what do we learn when we begin to look at mutation, co-occurrence, and exclusivity in individual clones or cells? And so with epigenetic regulators in dnmt 3 tet ASX and 190H, when they co-occur, they almost always are in the same clone. And so I always tell folks, we've spent now 10 years studying DNMT and TET and IDH and ASX01. You don't care what those genes do by themselves. What you care about is when these things occur together, because that's what's promoting malignancy, not these mutations by themselves, but them together. By contrast, signaling mutations are almost always in distinct subclones. So this is a patient that had FLT3 and RAS mutations and PTPN11, and every one of them are in distinct clones. And that really suggests to us that they really don't co-occur. There is an interesting exception that we see JAK2 and RAS mutations in the same clones in NPN patients that are progressing. So there are exceptions to that that may or may not have biological importance and we don't know yet what that is. And then we went ahead and asked, well, if we take one example of two co-occurring uh, kinds of mutations, DNMT3A and IDH mutations, and ask what signaling mutations layer on top, we see very distinct patterns. So dnmt 3 IDH1 clones have similar mutational patterns to IDH1 only, these two. Whereas the IDH2 clones with or without dnmt 3 a they look very different than either the 3A only or 3 a 2 So what signaling mutations co-opt what types of clones is actually very different. I don't have mechanism yet for this and that'll be something that we'll talk about hopefully maybe in person at some point in the future. But this all is still looking at one blip in time. What we really want to do is take this data and map out the journey from a wild type cell to a leukemic cell. And although we don't have millions of cells, with thousands of cells, we can make predictions about the likely trajectory. And so we use the Markov decision process to generate likely trajectories in every sample. And that gives you the most likely early event, the first event in this case, CNMT3A. Oops, then you get IDH2. And then when you get NPN1, not only is that the third event, but then the clone takes over because that circle is sort of consistent with the size of the cellular clone. And so what we were able to show is that different mutations have different roles in different points. And so you can show that Jack and IDH and DMT3A are likely in many cases the first event, whereas tattoo, like I said before, is either first or late. And then other mutations like NPN1 one. It's actually never first, but it's always in the dominant clone. So being in the dominant clone is not the same as being initiating. You can be, the initiating mutations are obviously in the dominant clone, but you could be the second guy. It's like being the second person to the party. And that's what NPM1 is. Whereas again, FLT3, RAS, PTPN11 are usually very late uh, events. The problem though with all that data is that it's predictions based on modeling. So we went back to our data and said, well, if we predicted in that sample, the DNMT3A is the first mutation. Can we see a 3A only mutant cell? And in about you know 40% of the cases, we see the single mutant only cell, and it usually matches up. But we need a lot more genomic data. So we think getting one to five thousand cells is not near the asymptote. And so we think getting hundred thousand or more cells will give us full understanding of the repertoire. We won't need modeling. And the important thing here is look at DNMT3A the RN82 mutations are much less likely to be initiating than other missense mutations, either because they're not initiating or when you get them, they quickly, boom, take off and give you AML. So then we started to look at mutational combinations. And so what we wanted to ask was, not only do what mutations co-occur, all four of these mutations on this slide co-occur, but only three of them, DNMT IDH1, IDH2, or MPM1 split three, result in expansion of the clone size. And so there's more cooperativity between those three, between NPM1 and RAS. And that really to us suggests that not only do you wanna ask you know, mouse modelers like us 
We care a lot about what mutations co-occur, because that's what you want to model. But it's not what co-occurs, it's what co-occurs in closet clonal expansion. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to do that. And again, I can talk about that after people have questions. And I think for us, we want to model these three co-occurring mutations and not this one. And then we wanted to begin to study serial samples and see if we could show clonal evolution. So this is a patient who had an MPN that was CalR and ASX01 mutant. And then they developed an AML that was IDH mutant. And you go back to the MPN, that clone was there, but it was rare. And so you could show the sweep from the one clone to another with lots of other clonal diversity. We've also looked at patients who um, have AML that get targeted therapy. This is a patient with FLIP3 mutant AML. They have these clones that were dominant that were all FLIP3 mutant. And then when they developed resistance, they developed the whole spectrum of clones, most of which were RUNCS1 or RAS. And neither of those clones was present free therapy. This is even better shown than this patient who really had these dominant set of mutations plus flip three ITDs. And then when they developed relapse, they had two things happen. The first is that one clone, which is flip three wild type and RAS mutant, which was already pre existing, started to grow out. And then all these other RAS mutant clones, which weren't there, at least at sensitivity to one to 10,000 pre therapy, grew out. And again, the lesson here is it's not like, you know, there's one clone you treat and another one, there's a population of clones. Most of them melt with therapy, and then a whole second clonal sweep occurs with therapy. So the one other thing we wanted to do with this data was link genotype to some sort of phenotypic data. And so like many of you probably know, with SiteSeq, you can begin to link up um, you know, cell surface with single cell um, gene expression. We have done the same thing with mutational profiling. So we can now match up self-surface profiling to mutations and begin to look at that. So what does that look like? So we can take patients and look at all of their mutations versus self-surface. So in this patient, all of the mutant clones have these different amino phenotypes with different surfaces, but there's one set of cells here with the arrow that are wild type and are CD3 positive. So the T cells in this person are not clonally uh, represented. So then one once you develop this technology, what can you do with it? So we've done two things. The first thing we did was go back to clonal hematopoiesis. And now you can take patients that have a mutation and now ask what lineages are the mutations present in? So in this patient, a DNMP3 mutation, we can see the mutation in their myeloid cells and then their T cells, but really not in their B cells. And in this patient who had two different DNMP3 mutations, the RD2 is in their myeloid cells but not in their T cells. And the R635Q is in their T cells, but not in their myeloid cells. But the ultimate is to go into AML. And so what we've begun to do is take AML patients with extended cell surface and mutational profiling and look at this patient. They have all these different amino phenotypes, what we call them communities. And the important thing here is that these clones here, these NRAS clones have massive expansion of this population seven Population seven has marked expression of CD11B. So we can see that the RAS clones have specific surface expression of 11B. It's a more mature amino you know, But if you had a cell surface targeting, whether it was a CAR T cell or antibody, you could specifically go after that mutant clone. And that is just shown here. And in fact, we showed in looking at 14 AML patients that the dominant clone had a different amino phenotype than many of the different subclones. And so we think that doing this sort of cell service mutational integrated analysis will let us compare how the branching clones are, and then you can actually find cell service targets on different subclones in AML. And we've begun to ask if there are mutations that do that. So IDH and DNMP3A correlate with increased CD34 expression, whereas NRAS correlates with CD11B expression. So we've got a lot more to do here. This was using seven um, different surface markers. We intend uh, now to move to 50 to 60 uh, cell surface markers, and we can then look at stem and progenitor state. Um, we're gonna add RNA to this, looking at gene expression targets. And we're gonna begin to do this in cases, for example, in solid tumors that have mutant hematopoietic and epithelial cells, where without fractioning, you could begin to do that. And so we're very excited about this technology and there'll be a lot more to say about it. And then at the end, I'm happy to answer questions about how we do these sort of work. And like I said, it's all either out or soon uh, to be out. 
So in summary for this part, you know, which is the bulk of the work, single cell DNA sequencing allows us to really look at clonal architecture and disease evolution. We can see interesting, you know, aspects of clonal diversity and dominance. We can see how different mutations and combinations impact that. And we can link that to immunophenotype. We need to do a lot more. We need to link this to clinical outcome. We've not done any prognostic work yet. We need to look at a lot more patients over time and we need to integrate other omic analyses into these single cell studies. But what my lab really wants to do in parallel is to go back to the lab and study um, the mechanistic implications. And so a lot of what this data gives you is mutational order and how leukemia is developed. And so what my lab is really now doing is developing mouse models that let us model order. And so the first of these models that Lindy's done is used a combination of TET2 CRISPR and NPM1 um, uh, uh, knock-in, and we can show that if you do the order the way it occurs in patients where it's tattooed than NPM1, we get a more lethal uh, penetrant AML than if you do the order the opposite way. And that allows us to ask interesting questions about are there epigenetic or transcriptional effects of cells or cell types that the order matters, and a lot more say about that. And more recently, we've begun to layer on three mutations, so we can start to actually induce different leukemias we hope in the long term with all these mutations in the right order at the right time. And so we'll have a lot more to say uh, about that moving forward. And really what we're hoping in the next few years in my lab is to develop a toolbox that allows people to model in mice all of the events with the temporal and spatial control that we see in patients. And we're gonna develop um, this where you can do it in different orders and different cell types and with different inducible uh, tricks. And so. We'll have a lot more to say about this in the next few years in my lab. And our hope is to functionalize a lot of what we see in patients and figure out what it means. And so one example of this is that we've developed uh, flip frit inducible uh, mutations like the flip 3 itd And so we can very efficiently induce the flip 3 itd somatically with this flip frit system. You could see 80% recombination. We get a modest uh, disease on its own that progresses to myeloproliferation. But most importantly, on the left, this is what happens if you have a germline flip 3 with a Crelox MPM1, you get a disease that takes a few hundred days. If we induce in mice exactly the way it occurs, where it's MPM1 and then flip 3 the mice get AML within weeks. And this really encouraged us that developing models that have more fidelity to the human uh, genetic data will give us more robust models. And we hope that will be useful for mechanism and therapy. And in fact, if you look, for those of you who are leukemia aficionados, the features of this flip 3 npm one model that are quite relevant um, are that it's a CD34 negative my, my, uh, myeloid progenitor phenotype. That's exactly what the human disease looks like. And so we're gonna be doing a lot of mouse human comparisons with, we think, better models for leukemia that were done before. And so that really is, you know, one area that we'll be going, and, and again, I'll have a lot more to say about that in the next couple of years as these folks in my lab, you know, really branch out and do that. But I want to come back to sort of this sort of progression and therapeutic dependency thing. And that is that we don't really understand how this process occurs. What is the process by which these early mutations initiate, maintain? What do they do to expand stem cells? What is the transformation to over disease? And ultimately, can we target this pre-leukemic state? And is it relevant? You know, as you guys all know, probably if you read the literature, every week there's another paper, often from the Sanger Center, where they sequence the dividing, you know, somatic liver or the esophagus. They're initiating mutations like polyps and CH. Every um, um, adult dividing tissue. And so our hope is if we can study this pre-malignant state in leukemia, it will have broad relevance. The problem though is we have no idea after 10 years studying them of one, what do these mutations do? So we don't know what TET2, ASX1, and DMT3 do mechanistic. We know they increase stem cell number, but we don't know what the downstream programs are. And a major limitation here is there are no good systems to culture these cells ex vivo, and we don't have good models to study their biology, and we can't do this. There is no organoid system for leukemia. And so we thought it would be critical to develop a system where we can study the biology of these initiating mutations, and ultimately use this as a platform for therapeutic target discovery. And so for about three years of my lab, we took every system ever purported to allow one to culture hematopoietic stem cells, and we tried it. 
And the system we ultimately landed on is one developed by Shaheen Rafi and Jason Butler, where they culture wild type stem cells on an endothelial cell layer that actually expresses an AKT meristylated allele and they could keep stem cells alive for up to 28 days. They took MLL leukemias, which grow in every model ever done and show they could propagate them. And so my lab basically took that system and said, can we do it? And so for the stem cell of I will make the point that we can maintain stem cells in these cultures for up to three weeks. And we can actually get 500 with thousand fold expansion of stem cells. We get millions of differentiated myeloid cells and we can after this culture propagate them for anywhere from uh, one, one to two to three serial transplantation. So that's nice, but it's basically replicating their work. What we're excited about is the idea that we can take all of our mouse models of all of our different mutant alleles and now study them in this system. And so what we do in the lab classically is take mutant and wild type cells, we mix them, they have a reporter, we plate them on these um, endothelial layers, and then we do three things. The first thing we do is ask, do the mutant cells win out and what populations and what's their biology? The second thing we do is we therapeutically perturb them with chemicals and ask, are there drugs that selectively affect the mutant versus wild type cells? And then the third thing we're doing is doing CRISPR screens to ask, are there things that affect the mutants but not the wild types? So this is a typical experiment in the lab. We take wild type and tattoo cells, we culture them ex vivo. We can map differential um, representation in different compartments. But more importantly, if we take that culture after three weeks and, and graft it in a mouse, you get selective expansion of tattoo cells which are myeloid biased. We can take a gene that we've been studying for many years, like ASX01, we have no idea really what it does. We can show that they expand primitive stem cells, but not progenitors. And we can do single cell sequencing to identify candidate targets. So again, a lot more to figure out in this system. But I think what we're most excited about is doing drug and therapeutic target discovery. And so what my lab has done in the last um, six months, um, right before, and now back after the COVID uh, shutdown, is begin to do screens in TAT ASX and GNFT3A knockout cells. And basically the idea is you identify therapeutic dependencies that are only seen in mutant cells and not wild type cells. The one caveat is any drug that kills the stroma, you can't um, study. Um, so, you know, we have to make sure they're not bleach. And so lots of screens ongoing, and we've found a number of them, and we're very excited about these candidates. And we hope uh, to have a preprint with some candidate um, drugs and targets by um, early next year. The other thing we can do is we can knock in and knock out genes in this system. This is very similar to work done in the organoid system. My boss, Charles Sawyers, has almost moved his entire lab from the vivo prostate cancer models to prostate organoids. And so we're excited at the idea that we can knock in and knock out genes and get very similar phenotypes. We think of the, this system as like a pressure cooker. It gives us four months of biology in three to four weeks. So it's not short or easy, but it is scalable at a level um, we can do. But I think the thing we're most stoked about is this um, set of experiments that I'll end with. And that is the idea of doing functional genomics. So Mike Wartz is a grad student who's been in the lab for nine months. Um, and so he in his first nine months has already figured out how to do um, CRISPR. So on the top, this is a Cas9 mouse. On the bottom, this is transient Cas9 protein expression ex vivo in this endothelial culture. And he's editing CD45. You can see we get 70% efficiency with a Cas9 mouse and 50% efficiency with transient Cas9 expression. So that's locus specific Cas9 editing. And then we went ahead and started beginning to do libraries. So we began to take epigenetic uh, CRISPR libraries of all the known epigenetic regulators. We can maintain representation now up to 14 days in culture. We validated efficient editing and we can move forward. And so we can do focused CRISPR screens. We're starting with kinome and epigenome, but you can do any screen you want in these things, including domain scan. And so this is um, data generated since the COVID um, break. So these are wild type cells, um, stem cells on the left. This is no Cas9, so there's no hits. On the right, you can see you get hits, but it's not huge numbers. And we're very excited that you get a tractable set of hits from wild type stem cells. And when we compare our stem cell hits to what are published as leukemia hits, this is the exact same library that Chris Valkush developed. A lot of the hits we get are shared, meaning they're not leukemia dependencies, they're wild type stem cell dependencies. And so again, what we've started to ramp up and we're getting data back every week now is to basically now take all of our 
preload genotypes and just CRISPR them and build debt maps of all the genotypes. I'm not saying it's better than cell line uh, screens, but the cell lines that are out for leukemia don't have most of the, there is no um, ASX01 mutant uh, AI or TED2 mutant robust cell line model we can use. So this lets us do relevant screens and we are scaling out to human systems, which again, um, they're more nascent, but I can uh, talk about it anytime. So in summary, you know, myeloid transformation can initiate from uh, mutations and epigenetic regulators, progressive evolution. We can map this using single cell profiling. It lets us look at clone specific genotypes and phenotypes and gives us novel insights into the leukemic ecosystem. We can model uh, clonal uh, evolution with increasing accuracy and develop better preclinical models for biologic and therapeutic studies. And we think we can ultimately use a lot of these systems for functional genomics, and we hope we're going to have a lot to say moving forward on that. So with that, it's just the same acknowledgement slide as I started with, so I'll just end and say that all of this work was done by Bobby and Lindy and Mike with help from Pablo and Aaron and Tiff and Nicole, and uh, we have lots of great collaborators like Jason and Sarah and Martin and Giannis and Todd and our folks at Mission Bio. So thanks so much. I'm, uh, I'm happy. Uh, uh, I think we've got plenty of time to take questions. Thanks again for having me. And if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you again so much. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Ross. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, maybe I'll start off with, uh, so you, you used an example of, of finding that rare driver mutation in a preneoplastic uh, sample. And you know, do those do those mutations uh, linger, or do they just take off into the leukemia? Do you have a sense for that, or is it? It's a great question. And what we can say is that there probably is a continuum from some that when they occur they take off, and others that linger, and a lot that have some tocasticity. And understanding how much of that is based on individual genes or even individual alleles within genes. So DNMT3 is 50% of clonal hematopoiesis. But if you look in the um, population of healthy people that have 3A mutations, you get a wider allelic spectra than you get an AML. So there are clearly are some alleles that predispose to AML and not. And even if you take CH and just take variant allele frequency and change your filter, the ones that get to five or 10%, you already get the same allelic spectra as AML. So we believe that there are allele specific differences in the propensity to achieve clonal dominance. And some of them are programmed to linger and never really pop out. And others of them have rapid transit and probably a lot in between. And mechanistically, no one understands yet why that is. It's a great question. So here's a question from Dr. Rizzoli, who leads our thoracic oncology. Hi, Chris. Um, you, you know, he, he, he phrases this as a solid tumor naive question. Uh, please comment on histopathologic correlation of clonotype do blasts have different clonotype than other leukemic cells? Does your clonal dominance or diversity vary depending on what you analyze, blood versus solid marrow versus marrow aspirate? So it's a great question. I'd say that we don't know a lot about that yet. All of the AML analyses in our, in our work is done on um, sorted blasts. So we, we did for the clonotypes focus on blasts. Now, those blasts can have different morphology and there probably are mutant-specific morphological abnormalities. The latter part where we do cell surface, there's no fractionation. And so we're very excited at addressing exactly the questions that Chris is asking, which is, you know, by doing that, we can start looking at, you know, we think many leukemic clones can give off neutrophils. And there's the intriguing notion that perhaps those secrete factors that actually enhance the survival of the leukemic cell in this crosstalk. And so we think that that's an area that we can explore moving forward. It's a great question. And I wish I had more to say, except that it's the direction the field needs to go. Um, here's a question from Dennis Bonal. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I might have missed it from the first part of your talk. I understand you did not look at prognostic patient samples, but from the samples you were able to analyze, are there any mutational patterns arising as an early predictor of treatment response. Also, are you seeing any mutation difference or progression based, uh, based on patient sex? 
So we haven't looked at sex at all. Um, and some of these genes are even on the X chromosome. And there are some associations. So I, don't, I can't address that at all. We almost, to a fault, um, avoided for this initial analysis looking at outcome. Part of it is that it's Sloan Kettering samples from the bank. And they're not from a um, homogeneously treated patient cohort. They're about half relapse refractory and half de novo. We are giving the data now to one of our co-authors, Aaron Goldberg, who's our clinical collaborator, who does have outcome data. And we're going to look at sort of the high diversity, low diversity, and see. But the next step, obviously, and I'm very involved in ECOG, some of you may know that, will be to take large annotated, you know, homogeneously treated cohorts and do studies like this. And whether we do them or others, I'm agnostic, but they need to be done. Um, I have a question, you know, maybe uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more about the very interesting cell surface proteomics. Uh, it sounded like you were looking at specific markers, and I was curious about the potential for, you know, using this as sort of a discovery tool for novel therapeutic targets. You know, how far away are we? I mean, presumably it's more than single cells. Yeah, I think right now you still need to do, um, you still need to know what you're looking for. So it's anything that can be conjugated to an antibody with peak. So you can just do a barcode. So we do think you can scale this to, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 um, epitopes pretty easily. So one strategy would be you can't do true agnostic target discovery, but you could take a set of candidates that have emanated from flow or gene expression and look and see, because for example, one that's only in 2% of cells with a specific chronotype, unless that's the one that always relapses. You know, I think there are ways to think about that, but true doing, doing agnostic proteomics with this is, is quite uh, some time uh, away. But in AML, where we don't have a good CAR T cell strategy yet, imagine that, you know, for example, you had a recalcitrant subtype that popped out from, I'm looking at the question John just put up of, Split three or IDH, and we knew uh, surface type. There's very good data already that venetoclax aza, that monocytic differentiated clones, relapse. And so imagine that if you knew what were the most likely cell surface molecules, you could come up with a pretty good list. You might develop antibody or cellular therapies to combine or to treat. So I, I think even without agnostic, we've got some. There's some shots on goal we can all take together. Yeah. So the next question. Thank you. The next question is from uh, John Reagan. There's been a recent push toward targeted therapy in AML via FLT3 or IDH inhibitors. However, your relapse data suggests that relapse is more driven by complexity of subclones. Given this, do you see the treatment of AML going toward combinatorial therapies or even TKIs with multi-targets thinking mitostorin versus GILT for FLT3? So I'm a big believer in the first part of that. I think, you know, again, leukemia, if we're ever going to apply like the success of hepatitis C or HIV to cancer, it's going to be something like leukemia where the genetic complexity, although it's not simple, it's tractable. Doing that in melanoma with, you know, high mutagenesis rates would be more challenging. So I do believe that this data, as well as lots of other data, suggests that combinatorial approaches have to be the answer and we're going to need to go there. And we're excited about, for example, combining FLIP3 and IDH mutations. And in the rare cases that have KRAS, KRAS is never a dominant mutation. But imagine that patient had G12, the, the G to C mutation as a subclone, and that's the one that usually the RAS clones escape IDH. So there are scenarios where you can think of a whack-a-mole where you could do and try and corner the leukemia. The multi-targeted one's a tough one. I find that really hard. Like the mitostorin challenge, right, is that you know, although it's a good FLT3 inhibitor, it's not a great one. And it's always hard with a single drug to crush multiple targets. So in theory, it's possible, but I'm more excited about the idea of having really good drugs against a set of targets that you each mix and match, not trying to have one drug that hits multiple. But it's a, that, that's, a, that's a game that I think we can all figure out together. Um, here, I have a question about, you know, you said there are no organoids for leukemia. Um, do you really need organoids? Well, I don't think, I think we need a system like this. Do I call them organoids? The issue really, I think, is that we believe that although I love cell death and I love drugs that kill leukemia cells that I can read out in two to three days, leukemia cells without some sort of system like this are gonna die on their own within two or three days. 
And so if you want to either study a cleaner phenotype for cell death, or more importantly, look at differentiation or self-renewal, you got to have something that keeps them alive for a few weeks. And we are very interested in those non-apatotic phenotypes that take longer to read out. And our thesis is that we'll find things that would have been missed in short-term experiments. It's the thesis. I'm not saying we're right. But that's at least the, the direction we believe that we'd like to explore. All right. Um, are there any other questions, anyone? You can just ask your question, but you'll have to unmute yourself. Well, so Chris asked, oh no, sorry. I don't know who that is. Um, there's a question about one of the features of CH that emerges after chemotherapy is that more cases with multiple mutations emerge than an age-related CH. Is that phenotoxic express leading to expansion of multiple clones or accumulation of the same clone? So there's two parts to that. I do believe that the fundamental thing is that these genotoxic stress don't induce mutagenesis, but they create a fitness bottleneck that allows either specific mutant clones or clones that have more than one mutation to emerge better than other clones. So I think it's more a bottleneck. I think that a lot of the P53 mutations pre-exist and the chemotherapy selects them out. And I don't think we know yet how often that's due to a specific bad actor mutant clone or a clone that's accumulating multiple mutations. And that's a direction. We actually have been collecting patients from Sloan who got cytotoxic therapy that have more than one mutation on bulk profiling and we're single selling them now to exactly address that question. It's a really good one. Right, any, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, thank you. this afternoon. And it was, it was great to have you. It was a great talk. And thanks uh, to the audience for the great questions. Um, have a great afternoon, thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone, for spending an hour with me. And for the, thanks, Wafiq, for the chance to present. I hope to see you all soon enough in healthier times. Bye-bye.